And I think the biggest risk we have on Bitcoin is if the stock market rolls over and collapses, right? If that happens, Bitcoin's in trouble. We saw it on the last big drop. Hello everyone, Master Trader Gareth Soloway is keen to understand the macro data and its impact on the traditional TSPI 500 and NASDAQ and the Bitcoin markets. Subscribe now, hit that bell icon, and embark on an enriching journey toward financial success. Let's unlock the potential of these markets together and pave the way for a brighter financial future. Welcome aboard. The upcoming crypto options expiry is threatening to add a significant amount of Bitcoin sell pressure that could take the price below another key support level. Over $1.4 billion worth of Bitcoin options are set to expire on August 16 at 8 o'clock AM UTC, according to Deribit. This sets Bitcoin's max pain point to $60,000, which indicates the price at which most options contracts would expire worthless. However, according to Cointelegraph data, Bitcoin fell over 3.6% during the past 24 hours to trade at $58,000, $101 as of 8.35 a.m. Let's take a look at the pre-market action here. If we jump right in, let's go to the economic data. Retail sales this morning, month over month, 1% versus 0.4% expected. So again, a much better number there. Initial jobless claims. Remember, this kick started a rally last week. Even though jobless claims historically are not a big mover, nonetheless, this number uh, last week caused that big rally. This week, again, better than expected numbers. Only 227,000 people filing for unemployment versus 236 expected. All right. Lastly, these two numbers don't have as much an impact on the overall market sentiment, but Philly Fed manufacturing index minus seven versus 5.4 expected. So that is worse than expected on the manufacturing side. An Empire State manufacturing index minus 4.7 uh, versus minus uh, 5.9 expected. There should be a minus in front of that. So again, these two numbers right here, not as big of a deal. The market is focusing on these two. And that's why we saw this big push up pre-market here, guys, on the S&P 500, a big pop, although we are starting to stall out right here. Now you see all these trend lines down here. This is that triangle of death, if you will. And I want to bring that up here real quickly. So let's get right into that. Bear with me. Let me erase that so we can go to the charts. All right. So what we have here is a market that yesterday we just closed on the lower end of the triangle, uh, the danger zone, if you will. And this, to me, is a huge level of resistance. So right, right now, we have the S&P trading above this level pre-market. But let's see where things end today. All right. I'm very curious myself. Now, if we do push up, let's take a look at our FIBs and see what our next level could be. Now, if we do continue to push up, it's pretty clear cut here. Our next level is a former gap fill right here, pivot high right here, and this is the 786. So notice the 618 Fibonacci is right in the mix too here. So not only are there three trend lines, but there's the 618. I could probably count on one hand how many times a market went through this many resistance levels. So it'd be very, very rare if we are able to close above today and confirm. And I'm going to mention that confirmation because the markets, especially with institutional involvement on options expiration, has a tendency to whipsaw the little investor, the small retail investor. So be very, very careful here, guys, if they do even close us above this triangle of death, if you will, because again, like I said, I could count on five fingers probably how many times a market successfully gone through this level and confirmed above versus a whipsaw kind of fake out from the institutional money. Now, why would this week particularly be a fake out week? Well, the essence of it is pretty simple. We have to remember this is options expiration week. What happens during options expiration? I think this is important for every investor to know. I view it as verified investing's job to educate you guys on all the nuances and the games that the institutions play. So what the institutions like to do during options X week, when a majority of the options expire on Friday, they like to kind of whipsaw the small investor. So they'll want to push things up 
getting the small investor to jump in and buy lots of puts, thinking, oh my goodness, this market's going back to all-time highs. And what they do then is in the remainder day, Thursday and Friday, uh, today and, and tomorrow morning, they like to whip that move in the reverse. So oftentimes what we call is an early move early in the week can be often reversed late in the week. So we've been going up early. We'll see if the institutions want to pay out a lot of money. Now, for those of you that don't understand the Options X game in that respect, remember that 99% of all options are sold by institutions that take in a premium. When you buy an options contract, you're paying a premium on that to own that contract, right? And so the institution makes that premium as pure profit only if that if that options contract expires worthless, right? So if it expires in the money, they either have to pay out or it cuts into their profit. So institutions will say to themselves, let's figure out on our computers where we maximize our profits on stocks, on the S&P contracts, on whatever it may be. And what they'll do is they'll say, okay, listen, we make $20 million if all of our options expire, you know, if, if these expire are worthless to the public, right? Um, but right now we're set to only make 10 million because some of them are in the money. So let's use 5 million of that to push that stock or that market in a direction that makes us make 15 million, right? So again, they essentially will use some of that capital to make sure that a market expires or an options contract expires worthless or as close to worthless as possible so that they can maximize their number. We can see again, NASDAQ was trading kind of sideways to slightly green early. Then we got those jobless claims numbers, nice push up. We are stalling a little bit here, but nonetheless, nothing too crazy on the charts. All right. Um, by the way, we're going to go over some earnings numbers here. I have a big level on Walmart I want to share with you. All right, so here's Walmart, guys. And if we go to your intraday chart on Walmart, check this out. Here's your intraday chart on Walmart. Walmart reporting very good earnings this morning. The stock is ripping higher. In fact, the stock is now up 9% on the day. But look at this. There's a very key level here that I have that basically we are just crossing pre-market at $75 per share. To me, this is actually a good short. If I was at my computer right now where I have my trading set up, I'd actually be shorting Walmart uh, above this $75 level. But the point is you have a trend line here, you have an overbought scenario. Uh, Walmart did report very good earnings. One thing that they said that is a little bit concerning is that more and more shoppers are coming to them versus staying at higher end retailers, right? So, I mean, you have certain fancy retailers, you know, your grocery store outlets and so on and so forth. More and more people are starting to shop at Walmart. And again, in general, what, what do we know that means? It means that prices have gone up and it's making more and more people kind of say, hey, listen, I have to, you know, trade down from my fancy luxury, organic, whatever it may be, you know, to more of a re realistic price point good in terms of you know groceries as well as other goods. Uh, so again, Walmart, nice earnings, but what does it tell us about the underlying health of the economy? I think that's the bigger question. Okay, so that's where we are. Again, $75 up here, really good area of resistance on Walmart. I wouldn't be surprised if we end back below 74 on the day and flip over to the charts. And what we could see on Bitcoin here, Bitcoin is not really doing a whole lot, frankly. And again, a little disappointing for Bitcoin bulls here, uh, because again, you know, here you have a stock market that's trading up again on the day and Bitcoin is up a little bit, but it's struggling. I mean, this pivot line here at this 61 ish level is just keeping it on the under wraps. And I think the biggest risk we have on Bitcoin is if the stock market rolls over and collapses, right? If that happens, Bitcoin's in trouble. We saw it on the last big drop. And right now, the stock market, again, flipping back to the SPY, the stock market is not only in the triangle of death, but it's actually pre-market above that. So it's even more overbought in the short term. Um, and again, just any sort of small pullback, let's just say it's even a small pullback on the S&P, it does make Bitcoin vulnerable for a pullback. So the key is this, if Bitcoin can close above this trend line here at around currently around 61,000 and confirm I then think it, it has that upside bias to get back to this 68, 69,000 level. If not, and especially if the stock market rolls over, watch out below. This thing could really start taking a beating again. 
Let's look at Solana. Solana, folks, um, again, Solana had this great big move up. Um, I unloaded our long and smart money crypto right up in this range. We took our profits. So far, so good. The concern on Solana is that it's had a big reversal move. All right, so we're going to get into some nitty gritty here on, on education. See this, see this candle here? This is what we call a wide range green candle. So it's notice how big it is, right? Big, chunky, long green candle. When you look at the, the bars, you have one, two, three. Notice how on the third bar, it closes below the green portion. That negates the power of the bullish move when you get that, all right? That negates any inside bar bullish consolidation. Then look at what's happened since then. Small green, small green, small red, small red. Notice how these are all inside of this red candle. That means the bearish flag pattern is intact. So on a very short-term basis, Solana is making a small bearish pattern. Now, if that bearish pattern were to negate, you would need to close above the, the red of this candle in the upper areas. We'd have basically have to get above on a daily closing basis the one, uh, 154 level. But again, my point is, is that these candles tell us something. Every candle can potentially tell us a probability shift. And I think, again, as you take the winning trader series, as you study that more and more, you start to get these little nuances that really do help you understand what is the probability of the move. What, based on where we are, what's the probability for the next you know, couple days to week? What's the probability? And, and to do that, you would go, if let's say you want to know, well, what, what do we think about the next month or two? Well, go to your weekly chart. All right. Weekly charts can tell us that. Right. So if we if you ask me, OK, well, what's your prognosis for the next six to 12 months? I would say, well, as long as you hold this level on Solana around this 120 level, this is all on the weekly chart, choppy sideways, bullish consolidation. So, yeah, shorter term over the next few days to, to three to five days, let's say the chart is weak. But as long as it doesn't get in close and confirm below 120, it's in a bigger bullish consolidation pattern. If it closes below here and confirms, that's where problematic issues arise, right? Then you can actually fail the bullish pattern here on the bigger time frame. So each time frame can tell you something and each little candle, believe it or not, can really give you insights into what the charts are telling us. All right, let's continue on to gold real quick here. Gold is, and this was, this is interesting. Gold was actually rallying early. And then on this data, people said, well, why the heck am I holding gold when you know, the markets are risk on, baby. You know, this this economic news, you know, and I'm being somewhat facetious here, but, you know, the, the retail crowd is saying, hey, this this is great news. Even the talking heads on CNBC, hey, this is great news. You know, we're seeing good earnings from Walmart, even though, <clears throat> cough, cough, you know, people trading down from higher end retail to Walmart. Um, and by the way, I go to Walmart even now. I mean, prices are so insane. I go to Walmart sometimes to, to do my shopping. So I want to be clear on that too. Um, but then you also have economic data like jobless claims, which normally don't matter. But last week and this week, now they do matter. Um, those came in a little bit better than expected. And obviously, retail sales. Again, retail sales is tricky, right? Because on retail sales, you have to ask yourself, well, let's look in depth. All right, retail sales headline number is good. But the question has to be asked. Well, let's look at delinquency rates on credit cards. Oh, wait, those are spiking pretty dramatically. Uh, let's look at car loan delinquency. So my point is, is that people are putting money on credit cards. The problem is they're not necessarily paying them off. It's just running balances bigger and bigger. And you can see the, the credit card debt numbers going bigger and bigger as well. The Federal Reserve actually releases this data on a monthly basis or quarterly basis. Um, but the but really it's unreported. It's not like it's a headline number. You actually have to go searching for it just a little bit. Okay. In any case, back to gold. Gold under a little bit of pressure here. Um, we have our levels on gold. So level on gold 2400 would be support. Resistance would be 2470. Thank you for watching the interview highlights of Gareth Soloway. If you enjoy this highlight video, please kindly subscribe and help share this video for us to share more of this valuable content. Thank you.